selfish president. Um, for those of you that know, or those that don't know, or you don't have to care, I'm Mark, Director of Participation. So um, this is a visiting production which is exciting for us here at the Playhouse. Most of the work we make here is produced in our own building, and normally we know an awful lot about the work that's coming through, but this has been specially booked for us, so it's exciting, and we've got lots of questions, I'm sure. On the chairs in front of you, we have got Tom Mansfield, who's the Artist Director of Upstart, which is one of the co-producers of this. Because uh, Felix will explain to us in a moment, there's been a, a longer life to Maddening Rain than just this current version. We've got Alison McDowell, who's the designer, and we've got Felix. Scott, <laughs> who you saw tonight, hardly moving for 20 minutes. I <laughs> waiting for your legs to move, but you did do it, well done. We've got Giles Chitty, and Giles is a friend of the Playhouse. Giles actually founded in 1984 the UK's first ethical investment institution, and is an expert in philosophy and finance. So we're going to chat with you all. If you have questions, please stick your hand up and let's go for it. It's not because, of course, I can't tell you what to ask, but there might be someone behind you who's got their hand up as well, and that way we should stop there being a bun fight on a Friday evening. <laughs> if you don't have questions and just want to bask in the glory of the themes of today, well, we've got questions. There you go. <laughs> yes, go for it. I want to start only because, uh, in case we run out of time, I've got to ask. I just didn't get the anything. And uh, so I would yeah, perhaps you might explain what that's okay. about. Felix, we never <coughs> held you responsible because you did not write the piece. Tell us about the writer. Uh, the writer is an American called Nicholas Pierpin, and he studied over in Britain for a number of years, um, and went to is it Yale? Yeah, yeah. Went to Yale, and this is his first first full play that he's written, um, and he's worked. He spent a lot of time in the financial markets, um, spent some years uh, working in the city, and, uh, but also had a, a real passion for writing, and felt that with the, with the collapse of the markets, he wanted to explore how that was affecting people in their business of uh, dealing with money and then dealing with their emotional attachments to the people around them. And also, because he'd come to London in the city, um, as a lot of people have come to cities and felt lost, he wanted to try and um, see if he could uh, explore that in a dramatic fashion. Um, if I can, the ending is quite ambiguous, and people take what they want from it. Some people have said to me, oh, it ends up all right, it's fine, he gets with her. And other people think it's actually a very sad ending, and he's living in a delusional world, and He's pretty much killed someone and is likely to go to prison. Um, and the question of, where, of who, who he is and whether he's been lying throughout his whole life and if, he's been, if his life has caught up with him. And you find out that in, instead of this, this big bravado that's given throughout, you realise that he's, he's actually quite a fragile character who doesn't really know where he is or what he wants to do. And so. What you're left with is, is quite a bleak ending, and some people find that quite hard. It doesn't end up nicely. I don't think it does anyway. I don't play it like that, but if you want to see it as it does, then it's great. Um, so I think you can take what you like with it, uh, but there is an ambiguity there, and I can understand you going, I'm not quite sure what that is about. I think that's part of the writing, which is... Just the same as waiting for God I'm not saying this is of that standard. <laughs> but, you know, we're all left with the question of why. And Did you get to discuss it within the rehearsal process? Yes, yeah, certainly. And uh, this play started over a year ago in London on a fringe theatre uh, called The Old Red Lion. And um, we had three weeks to put it together, and we did. Um, that was hell learning those lines <laughs> when we did it. Um, and so coming back to it over a year later, you get a bit more clarity with the subject. And um, we discovered more things coming back to it, and actually we do, we come back to, to the story. And um, we discovered that some, the ending perhaps wasn't as, as fixed as we thought it was. And perhaps before, maybe the old line there was, or before we did it before, it, it finished off on a bit more of an upbeat note. But it turned out we felt that there was more um, yardage Perhaps going for the ending that no one's quite <laughs> sure how he finishes. Does Nick the writer know what? Um, I think he 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 
he was quite keen for it then to be the only guillotine. Mm -hmm. So he's not giving away what happened. Yes, yeah, he's, dead. he's not tying up everything. So we did discuss that, you know, because naturally you do want to know with any play. Um, I, the more I do it, I think it's quite clear that he hasn't, he's not got away. He's actually locked in the city, says he can leave London, but he can't leave London. He's still going to be yeah. Yeah. Can I say something to that? Yes, of course. What I initiated to observe it. the whole of the basis for the circulation of money in the global markets depends upon disconnecting people from the human side of themselves. And at the end, there was an ambiguity for me, but it was in a way a positive ambiguity. And you were fucked. <laughs> um, and you might be put in jail and you might not, but, but what was positive was the fact that you had done something for humanity by going through that process. And that was, you know, in business I like to talk about composting my mistakes. In other words, you know, they can be turned into something you learn from them, it's something useful. And I think there is a societal potential learning there. And I'm not sure how many people pick it up. Yeah, but that's a very interesting point. Mm -hmm. But in what, in what sense, sorry? In what sense? Yeah, in what sense was there any benefit to society from that? Well, in we have sat here observing a bit of reality about the way our financial markets are working. That's what I feel is... is I, I thought it was really, really well... I mean, it was, it was really... I thought it was great, you know, I'm not a great... You know, I don't go to place very much, but... I felt was, the intensity was kind of as you might imagine, you know, that a, 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 a city might be in trading, the trading floor. You know, that sort of classic image of a trading floor. But it, it, it kind of, it kind of um, was a bit stereotypical in the sense that, in the sense that, you know, the sort of almost the sun might portray it. And, and, and it was a little bit of a cheap shot, I thought, in, in that sense. Could you be more specific about that? Like what, yeah, what just do you think was yeah, because it's so tremendously important. It's it's a really really Sorry, important. I, I lost you. Did you say that? It's yeah. it, it's the whole finance thing. You know, the whole finance thing is so tremendously important, and it's so much more than what was portrayed in the play. You know, in absolutely engaging as it was, and I loved it. But I found it was a little bit a little bit a bit of a cheap shot against the that whole you know the city, and 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 that's kind of like a com. It's it's. It, you know, it would it, it would go down well. It was, it would go down well in the sort of the press, the common press at the moment. But it doesn't really tell the truth. Doesn't it really feel like it's a play about fiction? I mean, the fact that the guys are addicted to a lifestyle he's he's the main problem. He's the main mm -hmm. the It's not really fiction. What he's doing it would be the same because they don't want to die so. I think it's hugely You're right. And, uh, the seductiveness of the city. Um, and I mean, I spent a lot of time on trading floors and speaking to traders. We had a lot of traders come in in New York and in London, uh, come and watch it because they wanted to see. And, there may be a crude stereotype to some of the people who are portrayed, but that's from the guys telling the story. But yeah, it's, it's certainly in the uh, in the terms of people being addicted to that lifestyle, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what it's like um, in people's mentality. Um, so yeah, Tom, can you contextualise the journey of the play from when Felix said it was in a pub? Yes, absolutely. Um, so this, excuse me, I would if I could. Uh, <laughs> a workout. Um, so this this play has gone from a room above a pub in Islington to uh, an underground venue in Exeter to just off Central Park in New York, and now it's uh, here in Salisbury. Uh, so we, my company Upstart, came on board with this project earlier this year. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Darwin Luff, our co-producers, who had been invited to go to Brits of Broadway, uh, which is at 59 East, 59 Theatres in New York, uh, who had 
I, I can't remember if it was, did they come and see the show in Islington, or did they... Oh, they just sent on a DVD. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the power of one conversation, yeah. bringing people together as well as they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they saw the show and they, they'd seen the reviews and um, they were really keen to have it as part of their festival. They run a festival that runs, if I remember right, from November through to about January. January. Yes, yeah. January. Um, as one of three shows uh, that they were bringing over, all of which were solo shows, single perform shows. Um, and alongside that, you know, we thought we have this brilliant opportunity to take it to another part of the world and, and show it, but also we have this opportunity to take it around the UK as much as we possibly can. So it's, uh, from my company's point of view, it's very exciting because it's our first tour. Um, and what has been really interesting, I think, having seen this in, this is the, the third city in the second continent that I've seen the show on, is seeing the way in which audiences connect with it. And every audience in every town on every different night seems to have a really different, I mean, I don't know if you have oh, experienced this much more directly than me, but for everyone it's such a different process. And seeing the way in which New York audiences are different to Exeter audiences who are different to Salisbury audiences is a real, it's a real privilege, actually. Um, Felix, what's it like to be a solo show? And uh, tying in what Tom just been saying, can you analyse an audience as you're performing, or would you guide that? Happening? You try not to, but there's always that, there's always that little character on your shoulder going, "Is this going well? <laughs> 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 not laughing enough. Now they are." <laughs> uh, I love being on my own. It's great. You don't have to. No. It's uh, it's always lovely <laughs> being in a company and. Uh, of course, but the the onus being on just myself, it adds an, an added pressure. So you have to, yeah. The preparation is, and for this is like no other play really. So I have to, you just have to be so, you have to be so prepared for it because it can just trip you up. And at any point, it often happens. I often stand there and think, this is going all right. And as soon as I do that, you know, <laughs> uh, so that you have to be very, uh, you have to be very aware. And what's about the feelings from the audiences as to whether they think it's trite or is exciting? Which bits differ for which audiences? Maybe you can answer that because I understand you. It's difficult. Um, the swearing in New York didn't go down so well. The swearing <laughs> tends not to go down well anyway. I think English audiences are totally fair thing. Yeah. They're very polite in New York. Yes. They didn't really like mm. the sort of uh, rude connotations and sex. Sort of yes. Mm. So, so, I mean, did they understand your accent? Yes, I, I slowed it down even more. I <laughs> 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 had that trouble understanding English. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let alone an accent. <laughs> it's interesting, though, isn't it? Because there's some things in the script that. Um, that have been changed yes. for this summer. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had to change. Well, particularly for the American audiences, we had to change. Uh, we used to say whispers for chocolate. Now we say Mars bars. <laughs> <laughs> and we had to explain what A-levels were, because uh, they have SATs. Marks and Spencers is a shop. Uh, it's hard to say M&S or Marks yeah. and Sparks. It's frustrating. Um, you, you, there's bits of the play that I really enjoy doing, and whether... The audience members really like it. I'm not sure, um, but the bits with uh, the bits in the uh, it, with Will and and I love doing all the little characters as well. It just breaks it out because it's a very still. I was I was informed to keep very still. People sometimes have a problem with that. They say, "Why don't you walk around? You know, why don't you go move the set? Why don't you go and jump up and down a bit?" But it's a it's a story. And as I'm sitting here now, I'm not jumping around. And, <laughs> and doing all this, I may gesticulate a little bit, but to try and get as much focus just on him. And then when the breakdowns do happen to Andy and himself, then it's a real impact for the audience to see. Yes. Gentlemen, uh, to be or not to be uh, <laughs> is about the limit of the words that I can remember. Right. How can you do an hour and a minute? <laughs> <laughs> Hard graft of just. I, I, there's a number of techniques that I use. Um, I'm quite dyslexic, actually. So, um, so to learn to learn stuff like that, it, I had to I draw a lot of pictures. Um, so I always explain this to people because um, 
Uh, for example, when I'm talking about the bonds in particular, I had to understand that, so I had to do a lot of research into what bonds meant. And I went to a trading floor and asked people and did a lot of research on the internet and various sorts. But, so, bonds to Japan, for me, I see, uh, I drew a picture of 007 and then him throwing that and then a picture of a Japanese flag, so I know that's bonds to Japan. So there's visual things for me to remember and I've got a whole I've got about five pages backstage of little triggers that I just test myself during the day. You can't help it. You end up saying one line and then before you know it, you've reeled off two pages. So you're like, I might forget. It could happen. <laughs> so the fear drives you on to keep on trying to, to keep, and keep it as natural as possible. Do you find, if you do make a mistake, do you, do you, how do you do that? Do you just sort of ad lib it sort of thing? Because you, know you know the flavour of what you're, you're the, I try going. not to ad lib anything. There's sometimes, if, you're, if your mouth gets a bit dry naturally in like an hour and a half, it, you, you just go a bit, Ugh, and that becomes very frustrating. I try to just let it go. But naturally in your head, you're just going, no, no, <laughs> why did that happen? But then you're already like half a page down. You think you just <coughs> focus on this, focus on this. And so it is, it, I have to concentrate a lot in it, really, to take <coughs> different journeys. Because it starts off very conversational, and in the end, you know, he's smashing people's heads into the wrench. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rom com. So, <laughs> I've got three all at once. How exciting. I'm going to go in the middle, just there. Um, as a one as a, I'm sure, what was your rehearsal process like? What did uh, you actually do? If we, the real rehearsal process happened over a year ago, um, but it was three weeks to learn it, and, and three weeks till I was on. So <coughs> once I scared myself of that, um, literally, if, I'll bore you very quickly with what my day entailed over the three weeks, which was getting up at seven, learning lines for two hours, going in at ten, working with the stage manager till one, being tested on those lines, and then the director would come in, Matthew Dunster, and he would, we would work on the bits that I'd learned. And the first day of rehearsals, he put a cross on the floor and he said, you don't move from there. <laughs> and so I said, oh, okay, okay. So he had quite an easy rehearsal process because I was just trying to cram it in. And some days my brain would just collapse. And he'd come in and say, I, I can't. I can't do anything with you, just go off and try and learn some lines. And so I'd kind of trade away. And then when I finished rehearsals at five, I'd go back, you know, have a bite to eat, and I'd work till 10 or 11 at night trying to cram more lines in. So that, the real rehearsal process was really just learning it. So when we got to the first play, it was just, it was really, it was, I was scared. I was, I was sick before the first performance. I couldn't help it. I was just so. It, it, we, had, we had reviewers in on our very first, uh, there, there were no previews with The Guardian and Observer in the first, uh, uh, first production of it, so uh, I had to be out there running for it. I was just sitting there backstage going, why am I here? What am I doing? <laughs> uh, but so, a year later, we were able to go into it in more depth. I found a lot of things out during the production. You learn, you learn from audiences what they like, what they don't like. And then I was able to... Uh, take what I'd learned from those three weeks and come back a year later, not have that mad cramming session, but it, uh, it was in the muscle memory. And so I was able to come back to it with a fresh eye, tweak things. We say that didn't work before, but this will work like this. So it was actually a much easier. We had one week to get it together again. And then we're off to Exeter. So, how do you actually learn the mind? You've got to start now learning mind. How do you do it? Uh, first and foremost, I have a card. Um, and I read the line you know, longer and longer then you test yourself on the page and then when that gets boring I write outlines and then I start drawing pictures and usually it's good if there's someone else on stage you can record their cues but I didn't have that so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Felix. Jasper, yeah. Yeah, a question about your, your relation to the character that you're playing I, mean, it's, uh, I presume you have to sympathise with it you want that person. But I just wonder, I mean you've played this character now several several times. Does your relationship with that character change as time goes on in your play? Yeah. I think um, 
I think he was, I, I approached him first, he was just this really brutal kind of, this guy who was just kind of cocksure. And, I don't know, he was a real, I could see him, I saw this really oh, kind of wide, he described as a wide boy, he was, you know, he was a lot of mouth, he was a lot of just, you know, doesn't, doesn't really care, and he was boisterous and uh, fitted, tried to fit in with this kind of changing room mentality of the, the trading floor. But then as I've gone on further going into it, I think you naturally have to find, if you're playing a character like that, you have to find some some sympathy with him, as you say. And I've, I've tried to eat that out more. And there's little, so there's little moments where he's kind of going through all this stuff and then suddenly just, uh, there's a memory that triggers him off and he kind of, he's there staring at something and trying to work out his own emotional side. I think emotions come to him throughout the play. Makes sense. Maybe it's all rubbish, but um, yeah, I, I, I think you've got to try and develop those emotions and try and develop a softer side because otherwise you don't have a light and dark. He just becomes this nightmare character. You just think, oh, shut up. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's that's. I hope that's answered. Thank you. Um, thank you. Kind of an inkling of that when he is in an awe at Ross's ability to put together all these bits and pieces. You know, oh, this guy is, is really enthusiastic about something. So he's got to have that side for his character. Totally. And it's a very low-key way of putting it in. I think there's not, the, the director talked a lot about that. Is, I mean, we've all had, uh, whether it be workmen, carpenters, or, or, or a plumber, or s someone with a, an incredible skill, or in, in another field, it's not just building. Um, but who has a skill that you've never done yourself, but you just kind of marvel at how they're doing that, and thinking, I can never do that. How you're, how you're putting a car together, how you're doing a painting, how you're uh, cooking some amazing meal, I could never do that. And I think there is a real, and that help, there's a real, um, a real enjoyment of that that he gets from that, and that's his safe place, that's where he goes back to. Mm. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I thought your acting was great, but I think the scenery, you and the setting really made you feel as though you were in London because of the train, the Ryan, you know, the hustle and bustle of it all. I thought that really came through, so I think that needed to be said as well. And so what was your journey yeah. with the design? Because it's um, terribly simple, but simple things are difficult. Yeah, that's very true. Um, in the old red line it was very site specific. We had a, so how big is the old red line? It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little room on top of a pub, basically, and Felix was right in front of the corner of the audience. Behind him we kind of create um, like a big, basically a big wooden box where he popped out of this wooden box and inside was a very corporate sort of city world where there was fluorescence which we've kind of developed and used in this way now. Um, there was a blind which we shone light through which had changed throughout night and day and then um, um, kind of a carpet and Bloomberg screens all in there. So we kind of just took it a lot more conceptual to go on tour with. So it kind of just created a feeling. Actually, it was really nice to do it a second time around because I got to kind of look at it a bit closer about what was really important about the first thing and what really worked and what didn't work. Um, like we said, we had three weeks to kind of put it together. And the first time I saw it was the day that we went on the stage, so that was a bit scary. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's. We, I worked with a really great team called BIDD Group who did the video and they went and shot their own video sort of stuff and we just kind of tried to create an art installation where Felix could be part of a world around him um, and we could light him and stuff because otherwise just one man things can be quite you know lonely and he needed to feel closed in and kind of pressured <coughs> so. so is this the, 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 the set that you designed for the whole series then? Yeah, for the so, tour. For the tour. Yeah, because it fits into all, all the different spaces are so different. There's yeah. really small, really tight ceilings yeah. or really wide ceilings, you know, really... So did you have to... Did you have to know... Well, I suppose you've got a sort of like a, a bit of information about what... Unless you, you either go to the mall first or you get some sort of information pictures or something, really? what, where you're going to be performing, presumably. Yeah, you, I mean, every theatre has a, their own floor plans and things, so yeah, you okay, just kind so of... Do yeah. technical drawings and hope that it's going to work. Yeah. Get there. <laughs> and usually it does. But this one was a bit different because the seating is completely different to the way that we've worked in any of the studio boxes. Yeah. So this, this is why we've had to push it all forward and 
kind of block out. You've got to keep it. keep it economic as well, I think, I suppose. You can't yeah. have yeah, really expensive and large bits of kit. When you move no, around. and this, these all kind of go up and fit into the back of the van and hang anywhere, really. In New York, everything had to, because there were normally at least two shows on every single night, everything had to go up and come down. Uh, normally with what, about half an hour? Yeah. 15 minutes. We did yeah. it in turn. They hated us. They, yeah. they loved us really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they had to unclip every single thing in 15 minutes, uh -huh. turn around when everyone was getting their glass of wine and stuff, and the next show was on. So that was interesting. Thanks, Emerson. I've got two questions back, so anyone else, get ready now. Lady Nervia. Um, I was quite interested in that. Coming back to the sort of empathy sympathising and fighting. My overall impression of the play was that he was lonely and alienated for the entire time. He didn't know where he'd come from, he told us that straight away. And it was quite apparent he wasn't going to fit in anywhere in the city, particularly not on the trading floor, because he was probably a bit of a bad boy, he must have said. And he shouldn't have been in London. Yeah. And, and that's the impression that I got. And that came over to me really clearly, and I don't think anyone else has seen that impression. But that came over very and that line about Barney at the end is all about the person. And um, I thought it was a brilliant return. And if you've moved him on from being this thug into what I perceive you were this evening, then I think that's a really great journey that you've made. Because in fact, you probably killed somebody. You wasn't even aware of it until you noticed him. You know, he just didn't fit in, basically. Charles, how many traders fit in in real life? Well, I think the gentleman over there was right. This is very stereotypical. Um, and I think that's the way the point of it is to concentrate the, that particular view of the energy of the trader into one person for an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, I actually think from traders I've met that a lot of them live extremely caring and loving lives elsewhere in their lives. And, you know, it's, it, there is a, a thing about leaving your soul at the door and going to the corporate scene, that, and I think it portrayed that very well too. And this particular kid from Leicester was particularly malleable mm -hmm. because he was naive. And because, in a way, when you look at a, a trader working on the trading floor, they're depending on the only human quality that really is intelligence is the, the ability of the brain to work. But most of the other stuff is pretty animal. You know, it's about competition, it's about performing, it's about surviving, it's about killing off the others. You know, all that is evolution really. Part of us because we are animals as well as human beings. You know, I would just say, I mean, I'm, I am in financial services and I know lots of people who have been on trading floors. There are lots of variables. They just are. Yeah, so, so a stereotypical issue. I, I, I didn't find this a fragile connection tonight. I would have thought that was a bit old fashioned 10, 15 years out of date by now. They're not they're not still in the market now. No. But there are lots of variables. So it's seen a bit a very good portrayal of what the situation 10, 15 years ago. As you say, it represents about half percent of what actually goes on. I don't think that killer instinct actually prevails that much because you don't set the time is take up gathering figures and analysis, and then you go in to do a deal. You don't go in a deal to do a deal over somebody else. You do a deal to make a profit. It doesn't, you, don't, you don't ignore what the guy next door is doing. You've got to make your figures. But a lot of the guys who get there don't come through that, that fullest of education. They get there because they're good at what they're doing. Yeah. Mm. Do we have a final question or comment? Yes. Um, you say that your character's been on an emotional journey and you've sort of discovered more about him. Do you find yourself, uh, do you see yourself finding more as you keep touring? What do you think you've reached? Well, how much more have you got for you then? Um, you see, we've got next week, it was, we go to Bradford and Hull, um, and then we finish off in the solo. So we're all next week, and then we finish off in the solo. So two weeks. Oh. Two weeks left. Wow, so not long for an emotional... No, really <laughs> but you know, I did 15 shows in New York and uh, you know, I did four shows in Exeter, it's my second show here, and every night I find something new pops up and I go, oh, alright, we'll go like that then. 
so there's always a, there's always a change, uh, and I mean I'm just coming back to the gentleman's point at the back. Um, I could, there are some, and, and your point as well. There are some. It's there, there are some crude stereotypes. Um, I think it's done for a dramatic purpose. I don't. I think it's it's it, it, a, the guy who wrote it spent a lot of time on the floor. I don't necessarily think the trading is what this is about. It's about him yeah. and what he, what he gets lost in. Um, and some people, as you say, some people are like. Uh, I didn't believe it. Some people like I, I believe it. I know that people. I've got family who are working that business come to see it, and we're like, yeah, I know those people. Another yeah. family gone. I work in that, and I don't didn't really didn't really understand it. But I completely understand what you're saying. But I think as a dramatic kind of concept for these characters popping up, it kind of helps to depict this guy's mind. That's who he sees. It's coming through him. It's all his. It's his. It's his vision of it. It doesn't mean it's necessarily true because they're kind of horrible, grotesque, mad people. You know, Andy is a horrible character. Any, if you met Andy, you'd be like, oh God, just get me out of here. <laughs> um, but, he's, but it's pushed, the caricature is pushed yeah. just for dramatic content, context. But um, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take it before. Can I just ask you about, because it keeps going back to the bowling alley, and yeah. there's this continual comment about things that have been put together perfectly and keep working perfectly. And in the end, they go back to a room where there's no people left, and it's still working perfectly. What, what's, what's the actual connection to that? Because it's the, it's the disconnect that comes through a lot of the processes that are involved here, where it's a human issue. You've got this machine that's put together and still just keeps working. Yeah. What, 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 where, where is that? Because I, I just think it's really very interesting. Do you know that? Well, I think, it, I think it's... Um you know, when you look at a machine broken down into a component, into its components, the end product and how it works seems incredibly <coughs> unlikely. I think if you look at the stock market floor from outside with no knowledge of it, it's impossible to understand how this could possibly be an efficient system. But it is. And in a way, the Ross putting together a bowling alley is a bit like a company putting together a trading team. You know, with back office, front office, EMD, and all the rest, they're all totally different people. And they're leaving a lot of themselves at the door when they come in. In a way, that's why they work as a smoothly running machine, looked at overall. But there is a human cost for the individual components, I suppose. Thank you, Giles. Thank you, Phoenix, and Alice, and the audience.